Hey friends, this is Dr. Mark Adams, and this lecture on Wesleyan Theology to Undeniably Bless Your World is about Jesus Christ. Another way to phrase that for those that are interested in theology is Christology, study of Christ, the study of Jesus. And we look at this today, of course, through a Wesleyan lens. I'm going to start with one of Charles Wesley's wonderful hymns. If we're going to start with the beginning of the story of Jesus, we could go back to creation and before, but we're going to start with the nativity and this amazing song, Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine own eternal spirit, rule in all our hearts alone by thy all-sufficient merit. Raise us to thy glorious throne. The Wesleys certainly believed that Jesus, born of Mary, a child and an infant, was yet a king. And we're going to look right now at the understanding of Jesus, the nature of who Jesus is, his divinity, his humanity, and how those are unified into one, being fully human and divine. And then we'll look at the works of Christ, his offices, and what he's done for us. Wesley, like all who read the Bible and preach or teach theology, uh, used many different phrases when referencing Jesus. There are over 70 uh, in the Bible, in fact. Uh, but, of course, Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and Wesley very often and very intentionally used the phrase referencing Jesus, the Word of God. When we think of Jesus, the Son of God, we are thinking of the divine nature of Jesus, and Jesus, the Son of Man, we are thinking of the human nature of Jesus. The Word of God made flesh, the incarnation uh, points to the union of the divine and human natures of Jesus into one. One of my favorite verses in relation to understanding the divine nature and works of Christ while in the flesh on our behalf with profound eternal impact comes from Colossians. Let's read this together. He is the image of the invisible God. He, by the way, referencing Jesus, the firstborn over all creation. For by Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, Jesus might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. And through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. In this text that Paul writes from prison, uh, he points out the divine nature of Jesus, 
coexisting with God the Father, in fact, one with God the Father, the creator with God the Father of all things, which the Bible tells us were created by Jesus and for Jesus and sustained by Jesus and held together by Jesus. If there is any singular text which speaks comprehensively of the divine nature of Jesus, uh, this is certainly among the chief of those. And then it goes on to remind us that this Jesus in fact, is the one who reconciles broken humanity with the holy God and who, through his work on the cross, has brought about our salvation, which, as we continue to stand in faith with Christ, find power in Jesus to live out the will of God in our lives. It's a tremendous text and speaks uh, biblically, profoundly, and very clearly to both the divine and human nature of Jesus Christ. Not everybody has always held that uh, Jesus is both divine and both human. This is clearly the biblical story and the biblical perspective, but there have been many today and always have been many that would have perspectives that do not align with the scripture and nonetheless have some influence over the work of the church. There are so many, it's, uh, we could spend actually entire series of lectures on early church and contemporary, what we call heresies. Uh, heresy is a focus on one aspect of the whole truth as if it were the only truth. And this being the case, these are not aligned with the whole truth. The Ibionites were among the first. These were a Jewish sect of Christ followers, ostensibly, uh, in the first and second century. Uh, the Ebionites mean the poor ones, perhaps because they were in poverty. We don't actually know much about them, but they viewed Jesus in much the same way that they viewed Moses, that is, as a lawgiver. And the Sermon on the Mount, for them, was the primary law of Jesus. But they did not believe Jesus was divine, not born of a virgin, uh, not of divine origin, not able, consequently, in any way whatsoever to bring about atonement, salvation was through following the will of God revealed through doing what Jesus commanded us to do. Uh, not an uncommon perspective in moralistic religion even today about Jesus. Jesus was a good teacher, a good man, and not divine, but we would all do well to follow what he showed us. He showed us the way. It's a heresy, though, and it's not entirely biblical, although uh, today's perspective is clearly nothing new. Then the Arians, a very uh, large, actually, movement in the early church up through the, uh, the fourth century, following uh, Arian, who, or Arius, rather, who taught us that um, Jesus is the Son of God, so this kind of a perspective of divine, but he was created by God as the Son of God, not begotten, that is, not a Son of God in terms of having the very nature of God, but less than God, used by God for divine purposes, used by God uh, in order to create uh, for us our salvation, but not the same as God. He had limited knowledge. Uh, he was uh, consequently not divine in the sense that we understand divinity. Look, kind of like a hybrid between Jesus the divine and Jesus the human, also not what the scripture teaches. Then there were the docetists who believed that Jesus was entirely divine. In fact, there were more early Christians that would believe Jesus was entirely divine and have difficulty believing that Jesus was human or in the flesh. The Docetists believed, along with many uh, who would hold more Gnostic perspectives, uh, special knowledge is what the word Gnostic means. It was very common in the early church, that, uh, or in the early Christian world anyway, that uh, Jesus appeared to have human nature, but not really. It was something of an illusion that God did save us, but God 
of course, is so good, so holy, so pure, as not to be able uh, to participate in the flesh, a, a common ancient Greek, uh, virtually platonic perspective, but also not biblical. Now, the early church gathered um, many times to have conversations, perhaps uh, the first, not perhaps, indeed the first uh, gathering was to um, in Nicaea in order to think through what does it mean uh, to actually understand Jesus as the Bible describes it. And uh, with a near unanimous, robust conversation, but a near unanimous agreement was that, in fact, Jesus was both divine and human, not in the Arian sense of almost, but fully divine, fully human. And in this way, uh, we understand Jesus. The Nicene Creed is the result of the work of the Council of Nicaea. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father for all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The Greek phrase that, in fact, we read in the slide just before this, um, kind of having one substance, is hypostasis. And this phrase has been theologically used to describe the conclusion of the early church fathers and Orthodox Christianity ever since, which John Wesley uh, embraced wholeheartedly and fully, uh, as do we free Methodists today. And it is that there are two natures, divine and human, in one person. Uh, hypostatic union. Uh, it is important, I think, just to note the, the phrase, the terminology, what the church fathers meant, what Wesley means, and what we mean uh, by this. The phrase is actually, it's very important. It specifically does not allow us to view the idea of an imaginary or merely spiritual perspective of Jesus as divine. Uh, hypostasis is a very concrete thing. It's a real thing. They were really Two natures really in one person. Furthermore, when we think about uh, hypostatic union, um, it is important to note that Christians might refer to this as a paradox. Paradox is not contradiction, but it does uh, point to something that has two opposite or contrary appearing realities that together as one, in fact, are real. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher, once referred to the hypostatic union, hypostasis, our doctrine as Christians, as, I quote, the ultimate paradox. And yet, it's true. The scripture teaches it, and this is our experience with Jesus Christ. John Wesley was very clear that Jesus was the creator of the world. We saw that, of course, in Colossians, and there are many other passages. But Wesley says, when all things began to be made by the word, by which he refers to Jesus, by the word in the beginning of heaven and earth, the whole frame of created things, the word existed without any beginning. Jesus is the supporter and sustainer of all things that have been made. The Son sustains all things by the word of his power, by the same powerful word that brought all things out of nothing. The words of John Wesley, clearly his perspective, and again our perspective, is that Jesus, the creator and sustainer of all things, is divine, one with the Father, 
not just a participant at creation, but the creator, uh, Wesley fully understood the nature of Jesus as being eternal, that is, not made, not having a beginning like all created beings, but along with God, pre-existed that which is created because God is the first cause, the creator. As Wesley said, the inspired writers of the New Testament gave Christ all the titles and attributes of the Most High God, eternity among them. Since the Son is eternal, as the Father is eternal, then Jesus Christ is therefore truly and fully God. We need not scruple to pronounce Christ God of God, light of light, very God of very God, in glory equal with the Father, and in majesty co-eternal. You notice here Wesley is referencing uh, the Nicene Creed and the hypostatic union. Um, we Methodists definitely are not confused about the nature of Jesus as eternal, as God, as creator, as the Son of God, begotten, not made. But we also affirm that Jesus was fully human. Oh, what manner of love is this where the one only begotten Son of God has loved us so as to empty himself as far as possible of his eternal godhood and to invest him, divest himself of that glory with which he was with the Father before the world began, to take on the very form of a servant. Wesley is commenting on Philippians chapter 2, a phrase in which we learn that Jesus Christ, not considering himself uh, equal with God, emptied himself of all things, taking on the form of the servant. It's called the canonic passage or the emptying passage. Wesley looks at that text and it's very clear, just as Colossians made very clear, that the divine eternal being found a way to enter into this world, taking on flesh. So Wesley affirms Jesus is the creator. Jesus is divine. Jesus also, according to the scripture, the divine being entered into our world. Or as John chapter 1 uh, points out, a, a fantastic text that Wesley delves into very deeply. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse 1. And then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Uh, tabernacle, tabernacling or moving in with us, becoming a human being. Throughout the scripture, we see Jesus uh, having all the experiences that every human being would have. He was vulnerable. He was born naked and crying of, um, of Mary in a manger, uh, so vulnerable, in fact, that we know he, he died on the cross for us. He had empathy. He had compassion. Uh, wherever he looked, when he saw those that were sick, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on crowds. They were like sheep without a shepherd human feelings and joy. He had joy when the disciples returned after having great success in proclaiming the news of the kingdom coming, uh, and many other instances where Jesus expressed joy and happiness. He also expressed despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? He was tired. He left his disciples for rest um, frequently, because he was tired. He experienced grief when his friend Lazarus died. It says Jesus wept. Uh, it was not the only time he experienced grief in the scripture. Anger at uh, the lack of care and concern, actually, for the religious leaders toward those that were uh, in need of care and love for God. And the way that people treated the temple of God, uh, he was hungry. When he fasted, he was hungry. Uh, he ate, and as we know, he died. In every way, Jesus was very, very human. One of the texts that most clearly talks about the nature of Jesus' incarnation, his divine nature, and the rationale so to speak, of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit for the Incarnation uh, comes to us from uh, the letter of the Hebrews. Let's look at this. 
since the children, human beings, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. God, that is the Son of God, Jesus, too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, that is Jesus' death, Jesus might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels Jesus helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, Jesus had to be made like his brothers, like human beings in every way, in order that Jesus might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that Jesus might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, Jesus is able to help those who are being tempted." This incredible text points out, again, the rationale. Um, it's, it's love, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent his only son so that Jesus would be able to have every experience that a human being has, so that Jesus can help us in significant ways, having experienced what we experience, empathy and compassion consequently, a divine, holy, holy, holy God, all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, found a way to experience what I can only imagine to be the infinitesimally small experience of every individual human being through becoming a human being. And in so doing, in the body, in, in the flesh, in the only possible way to destroy even death itself. That's what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection. And on the cross, we see, is where we find atonement. All of this is wrapped up in this one text and so many throughout Scripture, but clearly the heart of an understanding of who Jesus is and what he did, both tied together uh, in a nice, neat package in Hebrews, as it was also in Colossians. And so John Wesley, looking at the nature of Jesus, divine, son of God, human, Son of Man, Son of Mary, incarnated Word of God, usually when speaking of the offices of Jesus, refers to Jesus as, as do most Orthodox Christian theologians, prophet, priest, and king. So we're going to turn our attention now to the offices of Jesus and what this divine and human Redeemer, Creator, Savior, and Lord has done in and through us. So first, Jesus is a prophet. And in the prophetic role that is speaking forth the Word of God, the Word of God manifest, or as John Wesley said, Jesus is the heart of God disclosed to humankind, disclosed to man. And so in Jesus' teachings, we see the heart of God. Jesus preached from village to village. In fact, he said his mission was to come and preach from one place to another to proclaim the kingdom of God, to call people to repent and to enter into faith in the kingdom of God. He taught. He taught in the temple courts. He taught even as a lad uh, in the temple while missing from his parents, teaching the wise uh, leaders, scribes, Pharisees, in Sadducees in the temple. So Jesus has always been quite the good teacher, uh, explaining to us the very word of God, the word which he himself, as the lawgiver, provided. In fact, John Wesley very much, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, referred to Jesus as the one who revealed to Moses the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments, which is true. Jesus is the Word of God. Every word that we see in the Bible, all the laws of the Old Testament, the laws of Moses, the law of God is law from Jesus. But a, a, a lawgiver who doesn't merely give law to follow in a slavish way, but rather illuminates the law. He is the way and the truth and the light. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, the next lecture, uh, we see that Jesus illuminates the very commands and word of God. Also, uh, in a prophetic role throughout the uh, scripture, Old Testament and New, the prophets were often accompanied by miracles to demonstrate that what they said had divine affirmation, which we see in spades with Jesus. Healing the lepers and the blind and the lame, uh, feeding 
masses with you know a few fish and loaves of bread, uh, turning water into wine, walking on water, calming storms, casting out demons. Without a doubt, the hand of God was upon Jesus, the Son of God, as he proclaimed the word of God, revealing the very heart of God to the people of God. Jesus filled the role of prophet. Jesus also fulfilled the role of priest. I'm going to uh, share a quote from John Wesley and elaborate on it. Uh, he says, we could not rejoice that there is a God. I'll say that again, we could not rejoice that there is a God and in isolation. But what he means is this, human beings in our broken, sinful, depraved, perverse, unholy, at enmity with God in each other ways, cannot rejoice that there is a holy, holy, holy God who must by nature judge, purify, and cleanse sin. We all come under the judgment of a holy, holy, holy God. Uh, I believe it was Jonathan Edwards who had a powerful sermon. Uh, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Well, this is really quite true in terms of Christian theology and Wesley's perspective. Our sin merits judgment. So how do we find forgiveness or hope in this? Well, as we uh, saw in the uh, letter to the Hebrews, Jesus himself becomes the high priest who is a mediator. That's what a priest is. The priest is a mediator between humanity and the divine. And Jesus, the divine himself, is the only one capable of being unbroken, not sinful, but in fact purely good himself to be able to fix the problem of our sin. Thomas Oden, uh, a contemporary Methodist theologian of great renown, I, I love uh, Thomas Oden, said, God is holy. God's holiness constrains orders and conditions. God's love, God's love infuses and empowers, constrains and complements God's holiness. God would not be as holy as God is without being incomparably loving. And God would not be as loving as God is without being incomparably holy. In other words, Thomas Oden is teasing out this also paradox between a holy, entirely just God who cannot tolerate the presence of sin, and yet is a good God because of his uncompromising love, which seeks to find a way to redeem and welcome into wholeness and purity and goodness and love and joy and all the attributes of being a cleansed, redeemed, spirit-filled child of God. These two attributes of God, God's love and God's holiness, the heart of God, are absolutely necessary for each other. Only love, only forgiveness, only tolerance, and no holiness, no judgment, no order would be chaos and would allow perhaps even evil to flourish. God's justice does not allow evil to flourish, but his love does allow those who do evil to be cleansed, redeemed, forgiven, changed. Well, so we see throughout the scripture, uh, the New Testament, and clearly from a Wesleyan perspective, that Jesus is the go-between between between a holy, holy, holy God and a broken and sinful people. He is also our advocate in heaven, uh, speaking on our behalf. Remember, God the Father, I went in order to save these people. It was your love, God, that sent me. It was our love, God, that uh, promoted the uh, the whole incarnation and my blood, which cleanses these broken people, so that when you look upon them, you see not their sinfulness, but my grace, my love, my forgiveness, my righteousness. So the righteousness of God becomes our righteousness received by faith through what Jesus did on the cross, which Wesley referred to, well, the Bible refers to as atonement. 
Actually, atonement is an English word, and the English word was um, simply is this means at one meant. So the at one meant between broken humanity and a good God. Now there's a whole lecture on justification uh, and redemption. My point here is to share that Jesus is the way that the atonement has been achieved. Jesus' death on the cross and his blood shed on the cross became a covering, which literally that is what the word atonement means, to cover, uh, to allow for something which was uh, sullied or dirty to be covered over with something clean so that it has the appearance of beauty. Uh, and holiness, by the way, means to be set apart. So to be set apart for a special purpose. And our special purpose is to be set apart for God, to love God, to glorify God, and indeed to do the good works God created for us to do before the foundations of the world were laid. In all of this, Jesus is our Redeemer. He is the one who paid the price, who purchased us uh, out of our darkness and places us into glorious light, uh, all the phrases used in Scripture. Wesleyans believe that Jesus was indeed a good teacher, unlike the Ibionites, not only a good teacher, that he was, in fact, our mediator, our advocate, our Redeemer who provides atonement. And in this way, Jesus is also, without a doubt, our high priest and our king. The kingship of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, in fact, the most ancient and simple creed for Christians was not the Apostles' Creed. It was not the Nicene Creed. It was not any other creed. It was a simple statement which is found again in Philippians, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, Jesus is our King, proclaiming the kingdom. So we see this uh, very deep Old Testament use of the phrase Messiah, the anointed King, uh, to be a Messiah or to be a Christ. Jesus Christ means Jesus the King, Jesus the Anointed One, the Anointed King. Uh, so we see that this concept of the kingship of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus over all, is an office that he inhabits both divinely and while on earth. The kingdom of God brought to earth, which Jesus says is here and coming, not yet fulfilled. It is yet to come. And we have a lecture on end times and the fulfillment of the kingdom. But Jesus was a king, is a king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he demonstrates this perhaps in no way greater than the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is the most amazing aspect of what it means to be the king. Jesus the Son of God, the Son of Man, broke the bondage that holds all human beings, death, death itself, shattered it through the resurrection, demonstrating absolute lordship over death itself. The Creator entered creation and shattered the thing that our sin brought into creation, death and decay, and will restore all things. The ascension uh, an amazing act of Christ when after the resurrection he was taken into heaven bodily. That is where he yet reigns today and will come again. Jesus tells us that all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him, and we believe it. Uh, incidentally, I'm sharing one of my favorite icons or pictures of Jesus in the book of Revelation. It says that when Christ returns, he will have woolly white hair and skin of bronze and eyes of flame. Um, it kind of looks like uh, the King of Kings is going to come back, um, not looking quite like uh, many would see Jesus if they saw modern television descriptions of Jesus. So Jesus is our King. He's also the King of all creation, the King of the cosmos. He created it all. And something Wesley said, I also thought I would share. It's beautiful. I believe in my heart that faith in Jesus Christ can and will lead us beyond an exclusive concern for the well-being of other human beings to the broader concern for the well-being of birds in our backyards, the fish in our rivers, and every living creature 
on the face of the earth. Well, as we follow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, uh, let's recognize that Jesus' Lordship extends beyond the salvation of my soul, but actually the salvation and redemption of all the cosmos. And our care and concern, if we're following Jesus as Lord, is to see the principles and rule of Christ is extending to every fabric, every fiber of what we do as human beings and as part of the greater creation, which God has created. As we draw near a close, uh, this text from Isaiah rather summarizes uh, in a very wonderful way the offices of Jesus Christ. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In this one prophetic phrase from Isaiah, inspired by Jesus, as we believe him to be the very word of God, uh, we find an all-encompassing statement of the kingship, the priesthood, and the prophet nature of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, as we again come to a close, uh, this is one of Wesley's great hymns, Charles Wesley's great hymns, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Uh, and as I'm teaching this, it's just a few weeks before Easter. So I started our lecture with one of the Wesley hymns that talks about the nature of Jesus in relation to Christmas uh, and his birth and beginning, his divine nature uh, entering into our reality. And it might be uh, enjoyable and fun to see these wonderful words about the resurrected King of Kings. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia, as the song goes. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Lives again our glorious King, where, O oh, death, is now thy sting. Once he died, our souls to save, where thy victory, O oh, grave. Hallelujah. Love's redeeming work is done, fought the fight, the battle won. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. Alleluia. Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head, made like him. Like him we rise, ours across the grave. The skies. Alleluia. Praise the Lord, the powerful King of Kings gives us eternal life, makes us more like him each and every day. There, as I said, are more than 70 titles for Jesus in the Bible. And we just touched the surface of Christology. But I hope that you have a little better perspective of the nature of Jesus as fully divine, fully human, fulfilling the offices of the priest, the prophet, the king, a great mediator who suffered and was tempted just as we are yet without sin and was able consequently to give his life for ours and to give us eternal life. I close again with just a very simple creed of the early church, the creed that the early Christians would say as their article of faith, even in the face of a crushing Roman Empire that would tell them, Caesar is Lord. And in order to survive, you must bow your knee to Caesar, to a human Lord, to a false religion. To which faithful Christians replied, no, 
we will not bow. Jesus is Lord. And you can kill us, but we know because our prophet told us, our priest died on the cross for our sins, so we are cleansed. And our king rose again from the dead and promised to take us with him. There's nothing you can do to our body, nothing you can do to terrify us, because we know Jesus is Lord. 